Hello, Weirdos! I'm Pastor Darren. Welcome to the Church of the Undead. Here in the Church of the Undead, I can share ideas which are relevant to those who suffer with depression, need some encouragement, and for those who love or are just curious about the God of the Bible. And it doesn't matter if you are a weirdo in Christ or just a weirdo, everybody's welcome here at the Church of the Undead. And I use the word undead because here we are dead to sin and alive in Christ. If you want to join this weirdo congregation, just click that subscribe or follow button and visit us online at WeirdDarkness.com slash church. Full disclosure, I might use the term pastor because I've branded this feature as a church, but I do not have a theology degree, nor did I ever go to Bible college. I'm just a guy who gave his life to Christ in 1989 and has tried to walk the walk ever since and has stumbled a lot along the way. Because, like everybody else, I am an imperfect, heavily flawed human being. So please don't take what I say as gospel. Dig into God's Word yourself for confirmation, inspiration, and revelation. That being said, welcome to the Church of the Undead. This week, I'm bringing you a guest teacher, the pastor of State Line Church in Rockford, Illinois, Greg Giamalva. This is from Sunday, June 30th, where he's starting a new series entitled Assassins. And this first message really is powerful and it applies to all of us. One particular line in the sermon was especially poignant. Regarding sin, compromise will have you feed what you were called to fight. Greg talks about how easy it is to fall into compromise, a tiny step here, a tiny step there. We don't even think about it or consider it a problem until we're right there on the precipice. And he uses Samson to paint the picture. If you want to hear more from Pastor Greg, you can download the Stateline Church app, the podcast, or look for Stateline Church on YouTube. Here's the message from Pastor Greg. Well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? All right, very good, very good. Well, as you can see, and as Zach said, we are starting a brand new series called Assassins on things that are trying to take you out. Is that not ominous or what? Now, all throughout movies, right, there are a lot of famous movies that are built around this idea of assassins that are trying to take people out. Think of Terminator, right? He's a robot sent back in time to take someone out. And then T2 gets a little creepier because my man is made of liquid metal. And that was like next level Terminator action. Are you Star Wars junkies out there? You always talk about Boba Fett and how cool he is and how powerful he is. He really wasn't. I feel like he was really bad at his job. I mean, he gets swallowed by a worm, so I'm not into this Boba Fett thing. Tyler was telling me about this guy, this creepy guy from No Country for Old Men. Supposedly, he's one of the best movie villains of all time. I think he should be known for having just a really bad haircut. <laughs> Jason Bourne is a very famous movie assassin, uh, but Jason Bourne, he, he didn't know he was assassin because Jason Bourne didn't know he was, so he was trying to be a good guy. And then recently, John Wick is a famous assassin, and he just wanted to retire. He was done with the assassin life. He wanted to live a quiet life, and then somebody had to go and kill his dog. And so then he went and killed four million people. So there's the plot, by the way, of John Wick. If you're wondering, that's exactly what happens. But luckily for all of us, we do not have to worry about robots from the future coming. Though I do wonder, is this what AI is? Is AI going to become self-aware and launch missiles at us? I don't know. I hope not. But there are everyday assassins. There are things that are trying to take us out. Things like carbs. Yeah, sugar. <laughs> It's out to get you, those little Oreo cookies or E.L. Fudge, the Keebler elves, oh, they look so cute and innocent, much like these guys look cute and innocent, but then they want to get lodged into your arteries. That's what they're trying to do. Or cicadas. They say, oh, no, they're harmless. No, I went to Oak Brook Mall. It's an outdoor mall, and they were dive-bombing people. And so it was hilarious watching people get swarmed and attacked by these things as they're running and bumping into each other. Or maybe road construction right now is trying to take you out. Does it not feel like... There is road construction absolutely everywhere, and it's t uh, stealing your time and your sanity. And if you, if you let it, it'll steal your character. At Road Construction Live, you do some things that you know you shouldn't do. But the assassins that we're going to talk about are a little bit bigger than these. And the thing about an assassin, what makes it effective is the element of surprise. They want to be sneaky, and they want to sneak up on you like a ninja. But 
If you're aware of who they are and that they're coming, even the scariest of assassins, the terminators that are trying to take you out, you can stop them or fight back if you know that they're coming. If you look at Genesis chapter four, there's a very famous story in the Bible of two brothers, a brother by the name of, uh, name of Cain and the other's name is Abel. And Cain, Cain, he makes a sacrifice and offering to God. God rejects his sacrifice because his heart wasn't right. Abel also makes an offering and a sacrifice to God. His heart is right to which God is pleased with what Abel does. So Cain hears about this and he gets mad. And he gets jealous. And it's at this point when he's mad and when he's jealous that this assassin begins to sneak up on him. It's creeping on him. And so look at what God says to him in Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. He says, why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is an assassin. It's crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Did you know this is the first time we see sin mentioned in the Bible? And the picture that God gives us of sin is that of a, an assassin. It's like a jungle cat waiting to pounce on us, waiting to take us out. Years ago, I, this is more of a confession than anything else. I, yeah, I had a cat. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, church. I got to come clean. I had a cat, and this cat's name was Toonses. And some of you don't understand that name reference, but that's from an SNL skit. Toonses is the driving cat who would drive people and then take everyone over a cliff. Because really, that's what cats ultimately want to do, is they just are waiting to kill you. That's, that's, what, only, that's what having a cat, that's exactly what's trying to happen. But anyway, so Toonses would jump up on the foot of the bed when I was sitting in bed, if I was trying to sleep or read, and it would just get small and silent. And if I was looking at Toonses, it would just sit there. And if I turned my head, that cat would pounce on my foot and its ears would go back and it would attack my foot. So I'd shake it off and it'd jump back on the bed and it'd be small and silent, just waiting to pounce. And in a silly way, this is a great picture of how sin tries to attack us. It wants to seem small, silent in your life. It's no big deal. You can keep it around. It won't hurt you. It's okay. Nobody cares. But then you begin to ignore it. Or maybe you begin to cohabitate with it. This is why all of you should get rid of your cats. And as you ignore it and cohabitate with it, before you know it, it pounces on you. It has a way of attacking. And that's why God is trying to warn Cain. There's something that we need to be aware of, that there's an assassin out there. Sin is out there. It's waiting to pounce. It wants to take you out. But if you are aware of it, then you can conquer it before it conquers you you. And so God, he, he gives Cain the choice. He says, you can choose right. You don't have to give into this. You can fight this. But sadly, if you know the rest of the story, we know that Cain does give in to his assassin and tragically turns into an assassin himself. And he kills his brother Abel. And we see the first murder in the Bible, which just shows the insidious nature of sin and how it always causes us to do things that we never thought we would do. And so over the course of this series, we're going to be looking at a few different types of assassins so that we're not only aware that they're out there and that they're trying to pounce on us, but so that we could master it or so that we could subdue it. And so today, I want to look at the assassin of compromise. And to do that, we're going to be looking at a very famous person from the Bible, a guy by the name of Samson. Now, many of us have heard of a guy named Samson. We're familiar with the idea of Samson. He has long hair and big muscles. Whenever I picture Samson, I always think now the guy from Aquaman. I feel like that's what Samson would look like. It's just ripped guy, tatted up, you know, all that. So anyways, his story is in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is in the middle of the Old Testament. And a little bit of context as to the book of Judges. Israel, which is God's people at this time, they have this pattern that they're kind of into. So they're going to follow God. They're kind of dedita dedicated to God. And then they start compromising. And as they start compromising, sin enters into the narrative and they give in to sin. And sin was the assassin that wanted to take the nation of Israel out. And it led them into falling into the hands of the enemy nations or pagan nations. And so then Israel is suffering the consequences from the fallout of their compromise and, and from their choices. And so they cry out to God. God have mercy on us and, and God help us and God always has mercy on them. And so he sends a judge to free them 
or deliver them. Now, when we hear the word judge in a modern context, maybe you think Judge Judy, maybe you think gavel, you think robe, you think of a judge that's sitting on a bench in a courtroom. But at this time, they were more like military leaders and they were sent to deliver the nation of Israel from these enemy nations. So think more like an avenger. An avenger would honestly be a, a better picture, which is actually kind of interesting because Marvel has a superhero named after Samson. I don't know if you know this or not. If you're really deep into comic books, you're probably familiar with this. His name is Doc Samson. He's in the Hulk series of comics. He has similar characteristics, long hair and big muscles. He also has a similar set of flaws. Let's just say he liked the ladies a little too much, which we're going to get to here in a moment. So in Judges chapter 13 is kind of where we're going to begin today. In Israel at this time in history... They're being oppressed by what is arguably their greatest enemy all throughout the Bible, the Philistines. If you've ever heard of Goliath, Goliath fights David. Goliath was a Philistine soldier. So this was one of their greatest enemies. They had many collisions with them. They were fierce warriors. They were a strong nation that would come up against Israel. So God is sending Samson because a strong enemy needs a strong judge. And Samson had some superhuman characteristics. He was super strong. He had these unique abilities because with these unique abilities, they also came with a unique calling. So we see in Judges chapter uh, 13 that Samson's parents, they struggled with infertility. And so God sends the angel of the Lord to Samson's parents and tells the Samson's parents that the angel of the Lord delivers this message that, hey, you're going to have a unique baby. You're going to have a special baby. They're going to have unique strengths. They're going to have unique abilities. They're going to have unique powers. But with these unique abilities, it's going to be come with a unique vow, a unique calling. And so look at what the angel says in verse five, five of chapter 13. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite, dedicated to God from the womb. He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And so it begs the question, okay, he, he's going to be a Nazarite. Well, what exactly is a Nazarite? Well, we see in Numbers chapter 6, and we don't have time to look at it today, but if you'd like later this week to go read Numbers chapter 6, you're going to see what a Nazarite vow is. It was a vow that someone would take to basically dedicate themselves or to be of special service to the Lord. And this vow had three contingencies, or you could say it had three rules associated with it. So you could have no alcohol and no wine whatsoever. You could never cut your hair, so no haircuts, and you can't touch dead things. So no grapes, no great clips, and no graves. Got it? Good. That was the vow. That was the rules of the vow. And so his parents, they would raise Samson. And as they're raising him up, they would instill this vow. They would, would instill these values of this dedication to the Lord into Samson, much like Uncle Ben told Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Because Samson not only did he have great abilities, but he had a great calling on his life. He was to lead Israel from the hands of the Philistines, their fiercest of enemies. And so Samson, he begins to grow up. And as he's growing up, he grows out his hair. The Bible says he has seven locks of hair, seven braids of hair. And he begins to fight and battle the Philistines. And he's ripped, he's strong, he's on that Holy Ghost whey protein. My man's getting big. And he's, not only is he strong, he is a fierce warrior in battle, so much so that in one battle in particular, he goes up against a thousand Philistines and he picks up as his weapon of choice, the jawbone of a donkey. And he, the Bible says he uses the jawbone of a donkey to kill or slay 1,000 men. He really is like an Avenger. Thor has his hammer. Captain America has his shield. And here's Samson with the jawbone of a donkey knocking and attacking and slaying and, and, and literally conquering this entire army with this. What, what do you do with this, right? Like if this is his weapon and he's that strong that he could stand there with a jawbone, how do you fight a guy like this? So the Philistines, they know we're done. Dunzo, we, we can't fight this guy. He's too strong. I mean, we don't have the technology. We don't have the tools. We don't have the weapons. And so they get together and they begin plotting on what they should do with with Samson. And their solution is, okay, we can't fight him head on. So we need to send an assassin. 
okay, well, if you're going to send an assassin against a guy like Samson, he better be strong, right? He better be like John Wick or, or he, he, maybe do we have another giant like Goliath around? We better send somebody big that could maybe go up against him. Nope. They send a woman by the name of Delilah. Now we're going to uh, jump to Judges 16, verse 5. The rulers of the Philistines went to her, to Delilah, and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Remember what it said in Genesis 4, sin will try to subdue us if we don't subdue it. And that's exactly what's happening here. And then they tell her, each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. And so they're bribing her. So she has this love affair now with Samson. And as they start this relationship, she keeps asking him over and over again, what's the source of your strength? What's the source of your power? And it's like he knows that she's up to no good. Because every time he asks, he always makes up a story. He essentially lies to her and tells her something different is the source of of his power, to which she enacts by getting the Philistines to come and try to attempt to tie him up or do whatever Samson said because they're trying to trap him. And so three times they try to trap him, try to tie him up, and three times Samson breaks free. Now you'd think, okay, third time's a charm. Uh, he'd wise up. You, you, you know when your friend, you, we've all had situations like this where you have a friend and they're dating somebody and you like know that that person's no good for them. Like, you know that they're up to no good. Like everybody can see it. That's one, that's this situation right here. All of Samson's friends are like, come on, man. What, what are you doing with Delilah? Like, you know, come on, she's lying to you. She's tricking you, man. They just tied you up. Like, what are you doing? Like, why, why are you dating her? She's no good for you. But man, we can be slow creatures sometimes. Can we not? Love has a way of playing tricks on our minds. So Judges 16, let me read the rest of the narrative, starting with verse 15. Then she said to him, this is now Delilah talking to Samson, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No. Like he didn't, right? He did. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines. Come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands after putting him to sleep on her lap. And God, that's just cold. She lures him to sleep on her lap. She called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him. There's that word. And his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, took him down to Gaza. This is the capital city of, of the Philistines. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. He's never lost a battle. Larger than life feels like he's conquered the world and now he's blind, shackled, and working for the enemy. And we see this tragic tale. And when we hear this and look at this, it's hard not to wonder, how did this happen? I mean, he had all the warning signs. It clearly didn't have to be this way. How? How does a guy with this much strength, how, how does a guy who's supposed to be dedicated to the Lord, who's, who's made it his life's mission and commitment to take a vow to follow him, how? How does a guy with this much calling, a guy, a guy with this much responsibility, how could he be so foolish and squander it all? And Samson is meant to be for all of us a stark reminder of the danger of the assassin 
of compromise. And just like Delilah wore him down and nagged him into submission, I mean, she literally lulled him to sleep. Compromise has a way of wearing you down slowly. It makes you numb. It turns you into a zombie where you begin to sleepwalk through life and it begins to slowly cut away the standards, the locks, the braids from your life. The right choices begin to fall away. The dedication to your family falls away. Your walk with God begins to fall away and ultimately your integrity one braid at a time. And before long, your strength and your power is gone. And just like Samson lost his eyes, compromise has a way of taking away your vision for your life. When the consequences of the compromise come flooding into our story from the cheating or the lying or the drug abuse or the the affair, when they flood in, you, you lose the sense of what God has for you. You lose your future and you lose your sense of hope. And just as Samson was shackled, compromise wants to steal from you your freedom, where now you are bound to your sin, bound to shame. You're bound to guilt. It feels like now that that's what defines you. So you've lost your identity and your dignity. And and then we look at the narrative and we see that Samson was put to work grinding grain for the Philistines. You see, compromise will have you feed what you are called to fight. Compromise will have you feed what you are called to fight. He wasn't supposed to feed the enemy. He was called to fight the enemy. He wasn't supposed to support the enemy. He was supposed to subdue the enemy. But a surefire sign that you're giving into compromise is when you stop fighting your sin, you stop fighting your pride. You stop fighting your anger. You stop fighting your lust. You stop fighting your bad habits. And instead, you just begin to feed it. You begin to give into it. And you begin to live in a defeated place and think that that's now who you are and that's what defines you. And so you lose a vision, like I said, of who God called you to be. And some of you today, you need to be reminded that you, like Samson, were born with a purpose, that you were born with a calling, that you are not the sum of your failures and you are not the sum of your mistakes, that you were born and you were made for more. And so don't give into your mission or don't lose sight of your mission by, by giving up or forgetting what you're supposed to fight. Fight the things that are trying to attack you. You're supposed to make a difference with your life. You, you were called to do more with your life. You're called to make a difference in your family, in your community, and with your friends. And so don't let the assassin of compromise steal that away from you. Now, it's easy to look at Samson. Once again, we're familiar with this story. We, we know about Samson and Delilah. And it's easy to look at this and think his compromise just started with Delilah. Like he just had a bad day. He got in a bad relationship. It was a bad situation. But I want you to understand that long before he ever started sleeping with the enemy, he was flirting with sin. See, compromise isn't usually a one-time thing. It's a pattern. And compromise entered his story far before Delilah did. So let's chase his story back here for a moment so we can see how sneaky the assassin of compromise really is. So we're going to jump back two chapters to Judges chapter 14, verse 5. It would be easy as you're studying the Bible to just skim right over this verse and miss this. So Samson went down to Timnah and came to the vineyards, the what? Vineyards of Timnah. Now, to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him. Now, wait a second here. Let's pump the brakes. Remember his vow? No grape products of any kind. No wine. So what's a guy who can't have anything to do with grape products or wine doing going to a vineyard? Oh, I just like the vibe. (laughs) Oh, it's just the ambiance. They have music on the lawn, and so I just go for the music. This is like somebody on a diet going to hang out at Crumble Cookie. They go to hang out, oh, I'm just here for the smells. If you hang out long enough, what do you think's going to happen? Or the person who says that they go to Hooters for the wings. (laughs) Come on, man, you ain't fooling anybody. You can get wings at Buffalo Wild Wings. Lucha Cantina, a Mexican restaurant, serves wings. And they're very good, by the way. You can get wings anywhere. You don't have to go to Hooters for wings. So who you kidding, right? But what this shows us, is that Samson was comfortable being around temptation. And James, who is the brother of Christ in the book of James, he tells us that temptation gives birth to desire. And desire gives birth to death. And so if you hang out with temptation long enough, what do you think is going to happen? 
It's just a bad decision. This is the whole frog in a boiling pot of water. The frog could say, it's just water. I was made to be in water. The water's good for you. And what he doesn't realize is that he is being slowly acclimated not only to sin, but to his ultimate destruction. And so for every single one of us in this room, me included, we all have a vineyard. We all have, and it's unique to you, we all have a, a person or a place or a situation, or maybe it's a type of entertainment that we know we should avoid because if we go to that place or we hang out with that person, nothing good's gonna come out of it. It's only gonna lead us down to a path towards destruction. I mean, even this week, I, I heard the story about somebody who was talking about when they hang out with this other person, this other person always encourages them to drink too much and then they're ending up driving home with one too many in their system. And it's like, hey, well, what do you think? Maybe you shouldn't hang out with that person. They, they, they're no good for you. That's not a friend. They don't have your best interest in mind. Nothing but trouble awaits you when you go to the vineyard. And notice that a lion attacked him which is just kind of funny because in verse six, if you read on, it says that he tears the lion apart as if it were a baby goat. Is that not a weird parallel? Like we would say a hot knife, knife through butter. We wouldn't say, oh man, they just tore them apart like a baby goat. Were people just ripping apart baby goats back then and it was super easy. And I was like, look at this, I just ripped it. I don't know, but anyways. But what the lion should have been was a warning sign. What are you doing here? Why are you coming this way? Danger, danger, don't come this way. Stop, turn around. You almost got pulled over. The lies almost caught up to you. You almost got caught. Don't ignore the warning signs. But not only does he ignore the warning, the narrative goes on to say some time goes by. And as some time goes by, he ultimately comes back to the lions. So look at verse eight. It says, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass. And in it, he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. He scooped out the honey with his hands and ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, he gave them some and they too ate it. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Remember his vow? He's not supposed to touch anything that's dead but now he's reaching into a carcass for honey? Throw a rock at a beehive, my man. There's honey everywhere. Like, you don't have to do this. Why risk it? Why see how close you can get to the honey without touching the lion? Why are you risking your vow? Why are you risking your integrity? Why are you risking your strength for a little bit of honey? Oh, but we will do some dumb things for just a little bit of honey, for just a moment of pleasure. That's why Paul says to us in the book of Romans, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, use Jesus as the filter for everything. Make him the determining factor in your choices and your decisions. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Temptation leads to desire. Desire leads to death. Many of you know this. I was a, a student pastor for many of years. And when I did student ministries, I would say when students started dating, this was hands down the number one question that students would ask me, how far is too far? How far is too far? In a way they were asking, how much clothing can I take off and it still be okay? <laughs> it's the wrong question. According to what I just read in Romans, you should maybe ask how much of Christ should I clothe myself with? How holy is too holy? But here's the thing. If you try to see how close you can get to the line without tripping over it, you are setting yourself up for failure. But instead, if you say, you know what? I don't even want to get close to the line because I don't want to lose a vision for who God's called me to be. I'm not going to get close to the line because I don't want shame to flood my story or my situation. I'm not going to get close to the line because I'm not going to lose my mission. I'm not going to lose my calling. I'm not going to lose my purpose. It's not worth it. I have too much to lose and nothing to gain from just a little bit of honey. And, and notice that Samson didn't tell his mom or dad he brought them some honey, but he didn't tell them where it came from because what would they have done? Well, they would have hit him in the head. Samson, Sam, Sammy boy, what are you doing? We didn't raise no moron. 
Why are you risking this? You have a calling. You have a future. You have a purpose. You are strong. You're my little Hercules, little Hercules. What are you doing? You can't do that. Why are you risking this for just a, a little bit of honey? I'll tell you a good indicator. If a choice that you are making is a compromise, is if you try to hide it. If you don't want those who love you to know what you're up to because you know what they'd say, they say, stop that. You're better than that. Don't do that. You have too much to lose. Now, lastly, I want to jump back now to chapter 16 because it's easy to wonder, well, wait a minute. The Philistines, they got their heads together and they knew they couldn't go head to head with Samson. He was too strong and that they had to send an assassin to take them out. So why didn't they send a ninja? Why didn't they send a Terminator? Why did they send Delilah? How did they know Delilah would work? Well, look at this in verse one. One day, Samson went to the Philistine town of Gaza and spent the night with a prostitute. And word soon spread that Samson was there. Oh, well, that's how they knew. That, that's how they knew the, that Delilah would be able to trap him because Samson, he's no longer flirting with sin. He's sleeping with it. And, and they knew because he, it says right in the text, word spread that Samson was there. He just broadcasted to the world what his weakness was, that women were his kryptonite. And where was he? In Gaza, the capital city of his enemy, he is telling his enemy the very thing that could take him out. And as you look at the text, it literally just says one day Samson went to Gaza as if he just had a bad day. Or even with Delilah, uh, you look at this story and it seems like maybe he just had a one-time misstep. But first of all, Gaza was 25 miles from his hometown. That's a lot of intentional steps in the wrong direction. And we've just learned that Samson wasn't just having a bad day or took a bad step. He had a pattern of bad days. He had a pattern of bad steps that led to this moment. And so he got in trouble the same way all of us do, one step at a time. You see, nobody wakes up and they say, you know what? Today's a good day to tank my life. Today, I'm going to ruin my marriage. Today, I'm going to end my career. Nobody wakes up and says that. It's a pattern of small choices and small compromises that cross lines and that lead us to a place we never thought we would go. Jim Collins, author of a real famous, maybe arguably one of the most popular business books ever written, Good to Great, he was talking about the financial collapse and the corruption that happened at places like Enron and WorldCom. Look at what he said. These were people who, in the presence of an opportunity to behave differently, got drawn into it one step after another. If you told them 10 years ahead of time, hey, let's cook the books and I'll get rich, they would never go along with it. But that's rarely how most people get drawn into activities that they later regret. When you are at step A, it feels inconceivable to jump all the way to step Z if step Z involves something that is a total breach of your values. But if you go from step A to step B, then step B to step C, then step C to step D, then someday you wake up and discover that you are at step Y and the move to step Z comes about much easier. And so for all of us, when we find ourselves at step Z, when compromise comes to a boil, when that bad day seems to hit out of nowhere, Many times we think, well, I just, I don't, I'm not sure how, how I got here. It's just crazy. Or I don't know how this happened. It just happened. Oh, but it never just happens. Addiction doesn't just happen. Going broke doesn't just happen. The affair doesn't just happen. It's a pattern of cutting corners, ignoring warnings, and taking a step from A to B, B to C, C to D, and next thing you know, you're in a place that you never thought you would be. And you're at that point where mentally you're like, I don't know how I got here. I don't know how it happened. But God, but God, 
because of the grace of God. No failure has to be fatal. No failure has to be final. No failure has to determine your future. There's one last verse I want us to look at. Judges 16, verse 22. But before long, his hair began to grow back. Well, I'll tell you this. The jailers weren't very smart because they should have sent a barber into the cell every single day. But what this tells us is that God wasn't done with Samson. Did he mess up? Yeah. Was he blind? Yeah. Was he in prison? Yeah. But he still had a mission to fight the Philistines. He still had a calling. And so Samson did what all of us should do when we find ourselves living in the fallout or the consequences of our compromise. He turned back to God. He re-upped his vow. And the Bible tells us he prayed, he called out to God, and he asked for God's strength to come back into his life and so he could go out on his own terms and fulfill the mission that God had given him to free the Israelites from the Philistines. And so with one last feat of strength, he's able to bring down the temple where they worshiped their fake God, killing 3,000 Philistines three times more than what he had ever previously done. He had his greatest victory at his end... uh, the end of his story. And so listen, your mission, it isn't over because the hair on your head can grow back again. We follow a God who is full of grace and can restore that which is lost. Your greatest days can still come even after your greatest failures or your greatest days can still come even if you think that you're full of shame or or full of guilt or or you're full of fear and you think there's no way God could use me. That's just not true. And you say, well, how do you know? Because of the cross of Christ. Jesus had the ultimate victory over sin on the cross, which means sin never has the final say in your story, ever. Christ has the final say. He determines your calling. He determines your future. And so with Christ, anything is possible. He can restore that which is lost. But just like something began to happen on Samson's head, the comeback from your compromise, maybe it needs to start in your head because you've got some choices that you need to make you got some decisions. Far before your story can change, your mindset needs to change first. You have to believe that God can help you. You have to believe that his way is better than the way that you're on, the path that you're on. And so as we end today, I want us to do something a little bit different. Let me ask you a few questions for you to reflect on in your head, for you to ask yourself, what are the small compromises I am making? What are the vineyards in my life? the places, the people, the situations, the entertainment that I know that I need to eliminate this from my story? Or what are the lines that you're flirting with that you're attempting to cross? And then ask yourself, well, what choice am I going to make? Essentially, what am I going to do about it? Am I going to continue on the path from A to B, B to C towards Z? Or am I going to hit the reset button and start a whole new alphabet? and do things a whole new way. And if you find yourself living in the fallout of what seems like a series of a lot of bad decisions and bad days, maybe you feel like you're living in step Z right now, then you can pray this simple prayer. Jesus, restore what was lost. And so as we end, spend a few minutes, just silently, right where you're at, reflecting on these questions. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, as people in this room are thinking about their life and thinking about the insidious nature of how sin tries to creep up on us and how the assassin of compromise works and people are thinking about maybe some choices or patterns or or things in their story that they would know that they have hope, that you are with them, that you will help them, that you will never leave them nor forsake them, that you will help them fight whatever assassin is trying to take them out, but that they would maybe take whatever that, what seems like a small compromise, that they would take it seriously and be willing to surrender it at your feet and maybe do things a whole new way, make some new choices, develop some new friendships, some new habits and new disciplines in their, their life. 
And if there's people in this room right now and they feel like they're in the fallout of a series of bad days and bad choices, maybe they feel like they're already at letter Z and they don't know what to do. I know that you are a God that restores that which is lost. So give hope in this place right now. Let people have the strength and the courage to ultimately and fully turn to you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. They say, give the devil an inch and he'll become a ruler. I think this message from Pastor Greg Giamalva illustrates that pretty well. Hopefully, you found this message as enlightening as I did. It brought up a couple of memories from my own past about how close I came to crossing over from Y into Z, and a few times that I did cross the line. Now I'm a lot more aware of the steps I take and the decisions I make, and having that quote, compromise will have you feed what you are called to fight, that'll be a constant reminder for me to think before I step. Again, if you want to hear more from Pastor Greg, you can download the Stateline Church app, the podcast, or look for Stateline Church on YouTube. If you like what you heard, share this episode with others who you think might also like it. Maybe the person you share it with will want to join this weirdo congregation too. To join this weirdo family yourself, find us on Facebook, listen to previous messages, even find out how to join me in my daily Bible studies, visit WeirdDarkness.com slash church. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash church. You can find the sources I used for this week's message in the show notes. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me, weirdos, and until next time, Jesus loves you and so do I. God bless.